Hello? Okay, mic works. I can hear you. Actually, hey, Brittany, do you mind speaking? Just for me to check. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you.
We can go ahead and start. Thank you. Sean, are you going to um, share the first few slides on your screen? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Are you going to uh, share your screen? Yes, I did share my screen. Hmm. Oh, no, I meant in here, uh, the, the presentation. Uh, no, I was thinking it was on your end. Nope, I don't have it. Give me one second. No worries. Give me one minute and we'll get started. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is all a learning process for me. <laughs> Multitasking. No worries. Cool. Can everyone see this? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our workshop. I'm really excited. Um, Shauna has some interesting and amazing things that she's going to be, um, be working us through in this um, session. But before we get started, I know it's all about recruiting. It's all about hacking, but I at least wanted to let you guys know if you weren't able to join our um, our sponsorship booth, um, what JP Morgan has to offer to you all. Let's see, my computer froze. Um, so I know a lot of people, when we think about JP Morgan Chase, we think about the place that stores our money. Um, at least that's what I thought when I first was applying for internships. Um, and I quickly learned that not only are we a, ba a bank, but we definitely pride ourselves in um, the technology that we use um, in order to, to, to thrive in the, the industry. Um, so much so that we spend roughly $3 billion towards new technology innovations. Um, and specifically, if you look at, you know, the top four, Fortune 500 companies, about 80% of those companies do business with us. So, you know, the Starbucks, the Walmarts, we're proud to partner with them um, throughout this process. And uh, globally, JP Morgan Chase has about round, roughly around 50,000 uh, technologists. Um, so we are located internationally. Um, so as you guys are applying for internships in the full software engineering programs, keep in mind that we're not just limited to our Tampa office in Florida. We do have several other locations um, throughout the world. Um, so we, we do offer a summer internship program and then a full software engineering program. So the summer internship is 10 weeks. It's paid. Um, it's an amazing time for you to learn not only about JP Morgan Chase, but the, the tech stack that we have behind the company. Um, you will be placed on a, sp a specific team. You guys will work on a project and then be given the opportunity 
um, to present to some of our uh, executive sponsors at the end of the 10 weeks. So it's pretty fun. Um, lastly, secondly, we have the software engineering program. It's a two year development program. Um, you are put placed on team of your interest. Um, and then you're, um, you know, committing code just like uh, any of the uh, any other other associates within the teams. Oh, my computer is freezing, guys. Um, so I will in the chat send a link to you all. We did have a QR code that we were using in the other presentations on how to apply, um, but I'll put in uh, in the chat a link where if you're interested for the internship or the software engineering program itself. Um, you can just directly apply from there. There is three stages to this process. One is the actual application. Um, secondly is code view, it's kind of like hacker rank um, where you're giving a set of challenges, you solve them in either C++, Java or Python. Um, and then secondly, you're given an opportunity to um, explain your thought process. Even if you weren't able to you know, completely solve the problem, Explain what your thought process was, what would you would have done um, if you were giving more time, what you would have done better. Um, and that way we get to understand like your mindset and your thought process through everything. And then if everything goes awesome, you'll be invited to um, the interview portion of this process. That being said, and thank you, Cannon, for that link. But with that being said, um, let's go into the presentation. Sounds good. Thank you, Brittany. So to get started for this workshop, let me introduce myself. My name is Shada Sit. I am a software engineer working at JP Morgan. It's going to be my first year at the firm. And I primarily do development, front end development, but I also do a bit of graphic design as a hobby. I've done it for about four to five years and did it through UPE, previous shell hacks, as well as a few professional gigs on the side. So for today's workshop, we'll be covering something that I feel will be quite valuable for you guys when you are developing a project. And it's something that we at the firm value a lot, design. Next slide, please. For today's agenda, we're going to be focusing on composition, color, typography, which are considered the building blocks of graphic design in general, as well as a few tips and tricks to lead you on your way. We do have a link to a few challenges we are working on in the Google Slides, in which I'll be going over some of my design process as I work on them. The link is through the Hacker's Guide, but if you do not have it, you can also go to the link that I've posted in the chat below. Next slide, please. So let's get started. What is graphic design? Graphic design is what I consider visual communication. We're trying to convey a sort of information to the audience, and how we convey it is how we design it. The next slide, please. Why is this important? So you might be thinking, OK, I'm going to be developing. I won't be touching much of the pretty stuff on the front end. The user won't see what I'll be doing. Why is this important? Well, the main importance in graphic design is that it helps you create a meaningful product. If you don't create something that the audience will use or want to use, then what is the point of creating it in the first place? So when you Dig into graphic design, the goal is to understand your audience, to communicate, get your message across. And that's the main thing I want you to get out of here. In the firm, we've used a lot of design in our products so that we can build something that is accessible to the audience and it's usable in a sense that even in five years from now, the audience can still use it. Our features are modernized and it's not hard or difficult in any way. Next slide, please. To begin, let's start with composition. Next slide. Composition refers to how the elements are conveyed on the design, where are they laid out, which ones are on the top, which ones are in the middle, which ones are on the bottom, and are they big or small? Next slide. When you talk about composition, composition, there are three key elements. That is the structure, which I mentioned earlier, is where they laid out. Are they rectangles, circles? Your structure gives it some sort of personality, in a sense. Visibility, is it? easily seen or is it more hidden in the back which what do you want the user to see first in your design and information hierarchy so information hierarchy is a concept that's contained with the size of the design or the object that you want the audience to see as well as how bright it is how bold it is what, what makes it stand out what makes it different from the rest of the design 
you want the things you want to focus on in the utmost front. And the things you don't want to focus on, you want to put it more in the back. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the composition, there are a few layout techniques that you may have heard of. And you can use this for in any field of design, whether that be web design, flyers, posters, social media, videos, etc. Three common ones that I've seen used often are the rule of three, which is the idea of splitting your screen or your artboard into three separate pieces. The single focal point, which is the idea that the user is going to look at this one area first and then their eyes will trail off. And tying onto that, the golden ratio, which is a natural pattern or a mathematical equation, whichever you like more, that trails the, the eyes follow in a specific format. So as you can see, when you look at the golden ratio, your eyes fall from the outward all the way to the inner. So you want your information to be in the inner circle as the out lays to the in. Kind of sense. Next slide, please. So for our first exercise, we're going to be reorganizing the elements. If you have the challenges, what I recommend you do is make a copy of it, and I will be going over some of the things I'll be looking through during the design process. So let us begin. Brittany, would you mind switching it to the exercise screen? Thank you. Yes, give me one moment. Sorry. Are we having any difficulties? Coming back now. No worries, thank you. So on the screen, I'm gonna be showing you how to make a design through the simplest of all Google Slides, because you really don't need any fancy program to make a design in my book. We are given a layout. The layout is, to say at the least, messy. But there are some things that we know that we kind of want to sell. We first want to emphasize that there's a sale going on, 80% off our online store. And we want to emphasize the order now button, right? The picture is a little bit secondary in nature. So one of the key things you could do is see how can you sort the information. So for example, instead of putting the picture under the text, the logo right here, let's put it off to the side first. Let's Stay more onto what we want to focus on, which is the text here. A key thing to note in design is that your eyes will always be drawn to the middle of the screen first. So you would like to put information that are important in the center of the screen over the top or the bottom. Obviously, size matters. So if you put something that is huge on the top of the screen, then your eyes will be drawn to that. But if you put something that's small, it will not be. So let us start by moving the text closer to the logo. I like to put it more up. So what I'll do is I'll hold shift, shift and select both objects so I can group them together. And then move it a little bit to the left and put it up so that they're all in the same spot. And then let me do the same with the button. It is a little bit tricky to be working with this in Google. So what I recommend is to put the text like this so you can get the two of them and then click and move it right here. All right, we have the text in one spot. Now then, let's get the image back. The image, you could put it in the bottom, but it feels a little bit off, doesn't it? Let's see, how about we try the top? No, then there's this empty gap in the bottom. So why don't we center it and maybe enlarge it a bit too so that it fills up a little more space here. And then for the text, why don't we reorganize it? So we click here, move it up a little, just so it looks more uniform, and then continue clicking. Unfortunately, Google Slides does not have a group feature, but if you're using a design program like Photoshop, you should be able to group it to save time. And put it in the center. And there we go, we have a simple design. But there's something that we forgot, the button. We can just easily organize it right here like that. Another cool trick that Google Slides has is that you can sort of use the lines to help you guide your way. So let's say you don't know if things are centered. There's going to be a line there that tells you, oh, OK, this is matching here. These little guidelines 
pay attention to them as they tend to follow a certain ratio. And sometimes your eyes can be deceiving. I did leave an extra challenge right here for those who are interested in playing around with it. A cool tip and trick that I like to do when it comes with images in general is that if you see a, if you have an image, putting a border around that image helps contain your text in a sense. So for example, we put the border, drag it out here, and then put the box in the center, put the text in the center, Let's put it more centered here. Like that. Stretch it a little bit so it matches the box. And then put the 30% right here. And there you go. We've got a simple design where what we want is emphasized in the middle. And the box helps to put some unity into it. A key thing to realize is when you do the design, notice how this seems more playful. While this here seems a bit more rigid and professional. That's because it utilizes boxes. Rectangles tend to be for more professional work, while if you use rounded edges, they give a more playful vibe. That's why I mentioned that structure is important and that it gives personality to your work. Let us return to the presentation now, shall we? Give me one second, still working on my transitions. All righty, so now let's focus on the color. Next slide, please. Color theory in itself is a big topic that there are courses in college dedicated to the study of color, which is why I'll just be covering some basic, simple things to keep in mind when you're utilizing color. Three key concepts of color. The hue, which is basically what color it is. So is it an orange, a red, a blue, a yellow, purple, a green, or pink? Saturation, which is how much color is in the object. If it's less saturated, it'll be more gray and dull. But if it's more saturated, it'd be bright and vibrant. And then most importantly, the value, which is how much light and darkness, how much of a sh shadow is in that object. So something that has more value would be more on the black end, while less would be more on the white. And then in the middle is where you can get your color. There are other names for value, such as lightness or luminosity, but usually it's referred to as that. Next slide, please. Now, everyone is familiar. Whenever we say color theory, we always think of the color wheel. The compatibility of colors tend to be based on whether they are a warm color, which are red, orange, yellow, and or cool, which is purple, blue, and green. The reason why they're called warm and cool is basically how you feel when you think about them. Red is, you don't feel exactly cold when you think of red. It's hot and passionate, while blue is more calm color, as well as the distance. So I'm pretty sure you've heard of words like complementary color, ter tertiary colors, and anagalous colors. Complementary refers to colors that are next to each other. So if you put a red next to an orange, it's going to blend in and look more natural than putting a red to a cyan teal blue, for example. But if you put, uh, no, sorry, still going on. And then, for example, we also got uh, anagalous colors. I mean, that one was the next one. Anagalous is next door. Then complementary are the ones that are opposite. So green and red would go well together. There's orange and blue. You've probably seen that combination a lot. That sort of thing. We've also, there's something to keep in mind when you're working with color, and that is how, what kind of mode are you using it in? Is it in red, green, blue, or cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, or key? If you're doing digital works, keep it RGB. If you're doing print works, keep it CMYK. If you don't keep your color modes consistent, then your colors will look weird when you try to display it on, for example, printing a flyer or doing digital works. Another thing to keep in mind if you're doing printing, printed works is that there's no such thing as pure black. When you're making black, be aware that you will never get that pure black color you're going for, mainly because there's some sort of um, contamination in it that doesn't create that black. But you can try to 
mess around with colors close to black to make it look that pure black. Next slide, please. And another thing to keep in mind when you're selecting your color is that culture, time, shades, all have a mean, play a role to the meaning of color. For example, something that is red tends to have, like I mentioned earlier, passion, energy, or appetite. That's why a lot of food companies tend to like that color. Meanwhile, green represents nature. So a lot of environmentally friendly colors would use such that. And then blue is more of a calming, it represents intelligence. This is not all the colors there are, but there's, if you go online, you can probably find what each other colors mean. Another thing to keep in mind is culture. Red is a lucky color for some cultures, but it may not be for others. You don't really want to use something in an inappropriate setting because then it makes your product look bad to that audience that you're trying to sell it to. Next slide, please. All right, so we're gonna do a quick color exercise. So going back to the exercise, get it loaded. Right now we have a social media flyer. And as you can tell, there's a mismatch of colors. It doesn't seem uniform. And at some points here, you barely can see the colors, which is a big no-no. When you mix colors together, make sure you can view the thing that you wanna see. So the first thing we do is think about something that looks well with blue. So the first thing I notice is that the marketing for this uses a sort of pink. So we can go with that. Or we can use something like a white with that blue. The, the darker the color is, it's easier to put something like white on top of it. They're kind of opposites and doesn't makes it blend out. So obviously one way is to keep it all simple color right here since the text itself emphasizes what you want to read. So we can just click on them and change the color to white. And that's one way to go about things. We can also think, okay, so let's go back to the branding. It uses a pink in it. Let's put some pink in here to emphasize this part text because we see that it's definitely standing out. A darker pink might work since it stands out, but notice how because they're similar in saturation, the pink is, doesn't stand out as much as you would expect it to. Meanwhile, if you do something dull, it's really hard to see. So if we have to pick, something dark, but it doesn't match the brand. So the best we could do is this pink here. For now, unless you wanna mess around with the custom colors and create one ourselves. So maybe something like this. There you go, that stands out pretty bright. Then you can see what something to emphasize. Another thing to keep in mind is that you wouldn't be using pink for something for professional design probably since it tends to be more of a playful color. So for something like this, what we like to focus on is the color of the picture itself. So the picture I see has a lot of whites, blacks, and browns. It seems to be a very muted picture in a sense. So I go to my color palette and think, okay, well, I can make this orange here. Oh, wrong one. This one here. Okay, I can do an orange one probably, and it doesn't seem too bad. Maybe make this orange, make this a black here. Oh, wrong side again. Stop flipping. We make this a brown so it stands out more. I'm clicking the wrong side. And a white on top of the brown. Put this brown too, so we have some matching colors like that. And sure, it works, but it still feels a little bit off. Maybe we could change this, make it a white instead. It feels so much better. Do you see how when you just change one color, the mood of the picture completely different? First, it's not something bright and flashy anymore. It's more muted in a sense, more professional and clean. That's how one way color can be used to enhance your design. So we go to the next slide. All right. So everyone's favorite element, typography. Next slide, please. When we refer to typography, oh, next slide, please, yeah, <laughs> that's good. When we refer to typography, we refer to the art of arranging letters and text to convey a message. As you can see here, there is no picture other than the blue gradient on the side of the presentation, but 
the message itself, you can see what's clearly important, which is the text typography. Then I want you to know the definition and then a more muted color, as well as a smaller font, you'd have a bullet list of some of the key details of typography. That's kind of one of the ways you can arrange the letters and text on the screen to convey your message. So some of the key things to note about typography is legibility, how easy it is to read, the style of the text, just like color, just like structure. Everything you have conveys a certain personality to it, and you want them to all be uniform. You also have weight. So is this more bold? Is it thin? Is it light? Or is it just medium? Sizing, so basically the size and spacing. Some of the text, you can play around with things like letter spacing or the space between lines to make your text stand out in a sense. Next slide, please. So one of the key things to keep in mind with in typography, we won't be covering the exact details, is the anatomy. Anatomy of a typeface refers to the structure of the font. And the reason why it helps a lot in design is Depending on the way the font is structured, it'll make it easier when you're trying to space the characters in between, when you're trying to move the lines up and down to make sure that everything's uniform, or most importantly, when you're justifying the font. Justification refers to making it into a block of text instead of having it all in the left and the middle, and then there's little lines sticking out of it. Next slide, please. There's also many types of text. Everyone's heard of sans serif and serif. The difference between the two is sans serif doesn't have a tail, tail referring to the little hook that gets out of your text when you see it on the S and the, yes, the S, I believe. Meanwhile, the sans serif does not have that tail. Then you have monospace, which is more for the technical side of things, which is computers. And then there are display, which is for fancier, kind of more playful sort of design. That's not all the types of text there is there. There are stuff like handwritten fonts, which is to get that more home sense going on, or you want to play with around the you. Most people, when most designs that convey you use handwritten fonts, as well as a few other ones, like there's some based on pixels of a game, which is a sort of model space. The one thing you want to keep in mind with fonts is, oh, it looks like it didn't render properly, but you want your font to be legible. Please do not use something like lobster for your text when you're trying to make it into a body of text. That's going to be really hard to read. You want to make sure that whatever you convey, the user can read. And then we go to the next slide, which is one of my most favorite stories. So how many of you guys are aware of Comic Sans and the story of Comic Sans? I know that out there, most people poke fun of the idea that Comic Sans is a bad font and it's universally hated by everyone, including designers. In fact, I think it's the butt monkey for all design font. But why is that so? Well, the one thing to know is that Comic Sans is hated because it was overused when it was released. Originally, the font was created to, by Microsoft to serve a purpose, but everyone thought this purpose is not just what it can be used for. They started using it for things like professional settings and stuff. You can see how weird it is to see a Comic Sans for something like a flyer to apply to an internship or, you know, the letter to your boss in Comic Sans. And because of that, it got a reputation for being bad. To be fair, though, it isn't the best of font. The issue with Comic Sans comes with the way the font is structured. The spacing in between the letters can be a bit uneven because it's trying to mimic that handwritten nature. And because of that unevenness, you won't get the strong uniformity when you're using it in your design. I did hear that in recent editions, Microsoft has started fixing some of these um, spacing issues between it. But once you get that reputation, it's really hard to wipe it clean. So that is the story of Comic Sans. As you can tell, font holds a lot of meaning. Next slide, please. So we're going to start with our exercise, which this time will be focused on typing. Let us begin. All right. So when I talk about illegible fonts, this cursive fonts, be very careful with them. They tend to be really hard to read. And don't believe that it's an ability that many people have nowadays. So the first thing we're going to do is, OK, this, is gonna, this seems to be the header. And this seems to be more of a subheader, minor text. 
while the button is what we want to emphasize in a sense. Why is the button so small? And in comic stance too. So the first thing I would think of doing is, let's see, let's see. Well, we could go for something like, let's see, let's see. We could go something like Times New Roman, but that's a little bit professional for an ice cream brand, I feel. So let's try something like a sans serif. Sans serifs tend to be clean and it emphasizes a sense of beauty to its design, but it isn't enough that it's professional. They tend to be a little bit more casual thoughts. Although I've seen many sans serif be used in professional settings. It's just that versatile in my eyes. So let's start with something like Railway. Railway looks good. Comfort looks pretty good too. To bolt this text. Bolt it. We seem to have a strong bolt. So let's go back to Railway. Does that have a stronger bolt? Ah, black. That's good. Let's try now this black. We can have it emphasized. Now let's see what we can do on the bottom. So you can control A to hold it. Let's go back. Let's see. Let's start with normal. We want it to be under. We want it to be less emphasized. It's a better word to put it. So we'll put it right here. And then let's move the button a little bit more down. Buttons are a little bit tricky with slides. Like this, and then let's put it in the same font. So let's put it on railway. Make it black so it could be seen more and increase the size of the font. And it's a better fix than what we had before. This is one way to go about it. Now, one of the key tricks is to use a similar typeface with each other because they tend to flow well together. But if you want to be a little bit more different, so let's say you really don't want to use railway or railway again, play around with something like Montserrat, for example. Might not be as fun, or we can use something more playful on the bottom. So for example, that comfort didn't look well on the top, but on the bottom, it's not too shabby. It doesn't stand out as much, and it gives it a certain flavor to it. So it really is up to your personal preferences to play around with the fonts. There are some really common font pairings out there, like putting a serif text and a sans serif as the body. And I will be spending, I will be saying a link of a resource that will help you determine font pairing. And then just a little fun side example. I do have a little dog here that I said for the fashion brand. And on this one, we can tell that here's what we want to emphasize. And obviously don't mix match fonts like this. That's probably not a good idea unless you're trying to go for a special effect. So on the bottom, we can click here. Let's see. Well, what a playful one. So let me try Montserrat. That sounds good, right? Here. Gives it that professional sense. And then here we can continue it on. Maybe put keep this Lazar, Lazar. Put it like that, and then decrease the bold. It doesn't seem good if we decrease the bold. We'll have to swap it. Let's go to, for example, Lata. Lata looks good. Doesn't look too bright. Keep it on light. And then it's not as emphasized. It becomes an auxiliary element to the background, but it keeps the design consistent. And then you see flash sale. Then we have some little tags on the back for that sort of thing. You can play around with font combinations to see which one suits your design best. Lots of trial and error here is what I recommend. So let's go back to the presentation. All right, next slide, please. So the final thing I want to leave the presentation with is you've learned a few concepts of design. You've had your hand playing around with them. What are some tips and tricks that you can take away from this presentation with design? Let's go, next slide please. The first tip I want all you aspiring designers to learn is to pay attention to your target audience. What generation are they? Are they younger? Perhaps if they're younger, then you may be able to use some of the latest trends like pop or sci-fi onto your designs, make it a little bit more playful in that nature. 
but are they older? If they're on the older business like Cheddar Generation, then you'd want to focus more on square professionalism because you want to cater to your audience, your design. Another key thing to keep in mind, and it's super important, is how accessible is your design. Try not to use colors that a colorblind person cannot see. Otherwise, they won't be able to enjoy your design as much, especially if you're designing something for web development and you need to make sure that all the users can see this button, but you put it at the same color that the colorblind person cannot see. How are they able to, gonna use it then? Same thing with cultural differences. As mentioned earlier, be careful with the culture that you are putting your design in. If you're putting design in a certain culture, make sure that the imagery you're using doesn't have any negative connotations. Make sure that the text you're using doesn't have any negative connotations. You don't want to be seen as uncaring and uneducated to that audience. You want to make sure that your uh, credibility is built. Next slide, please. Most importantly, your audience comes first, but so is the purpose of your message. Why should we care about your design? What do you want to say? Don't put text all over the place. Keep it clear and concise. And most importantly, where is your design focused on? If you're doing a design on something like a do not disturb, you don't want it to be littered with text. You want the do not disturb to be up there front and center so that the people do not disturb you. Next slide, please. And another key thing I like to keep in mind is research the latest trends and styles. What are other designers using? You don't live in a bubble when you're designing. There are things that are last fat, outdated, and then there's things that are more modern. And that's something you should pay attention to if you're aiming to be a designer. Some current trends that I've noticed when I was designing throughout my career is that most designers have been using things like minimalism, which is the idea of keeping as little information as possible on the screen. An image is as simple, two colors, like that bird there. You can tell what's there because of how simple it is and because it pays attention more on the shape of the object. Emojis have been popular too, as you can tell with us using emojis everywhere through the chats. And it, and I think that Discord has its channels labeled with emojis. They give that social media energy to your design. And I do say that the influence of social media has popularized the use of emojis. Another thing that's popular is illustrations. So when I mean illustrations, I refer to both vector and hand drawn. Vectors are used universally for all sorts of designs, but I've seen a lot of hand-drawn give that connotation of homeliness, startup, I'm near you and I'm close. So try using our brand kind of thing. You're, you'll feel right at home because it has that down-to-earth feel to it. And then there's 3D art, which has been very popular. Just anything with the 3D sphere and the perspective. If you ever do get the chance to play around with it, I recommend you give it a try because it helps from the cement your concepts quite clearly. All right, next slide, please. So another key thing I want you to keep in mind is just like in development, good resources save you time. If you, you don't have to recreate all the fonts in the world to do your design, you don't have to recreate the color combinations. There's stuff out there that you can use. But if you do use them, be very, very careful, especially if you're trying to pursue a career in design. Pay attention to attribution and copyright rules. Some, uh, some resources require you to credit them, and some resources are strictly for personal only. If you use something that is strictly for personal for a commercial project, you might run into some trouble. Personally, when it comes to fonts, I do love Google Fonts. It's very universal and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. They work for Figma, they work for Adobe, and they work for many sorts of techniques. But there's other sites out there. If you have Adobe, like the Adobe Creative Cloud, they also have Adobe Fonts, which I recommend you check it out. Adobe Fonts does have a nice feature which allows you to pair with other fonts. Speaking of font pairing, the site Font Pair shows you common font pairing combinations, just as the name says. If you're looking for illustrations or photos, some nice no odd attribution that I've seen used a lot in development as well as in just practice for design is the ones listed above there, especially on Splash API. In terms of color combinations, if you can't think of any color combinations or you want to learn how can you come up with a good one, I recommend you check those links out there. 
gradients have been a pretty popular trend in design. So if you want to know which are the cool gradients to use, something to check out is UI gradients. They have quite a few combinations out there that are universal in a sense. And then if you're always looking for references or ideas to popular design sites are Dribbble and Behance. Though I do recommend also taking a look at Adobe because Adobe has a few resources out there as well as design challenges to keep you motivated and going. All right, next slide, please. And finally, design is an evolving process. You don't have to just learn from the people that are doing it. Learn from the people that study design for a living. So what do the blogs, the discussion posts, and the books say? A book that I like to always recommend is something called The Design of Everyday Things. And that is because its concepts aren't just for graphic design alone but it teaches you why are things built the way they do. And it emphasizes the use of listening to your audience and emphasizing with them. And I feel that's super important if you're trying to become a designer, because as mentioned earlier, the reason you're designing your product is because you're trying to give it to someone to look at. You're trying to sell it in a sense. So you're trying to just appeal to something and to make sure that you appeal to it properly you have to, what, who are you appealing it to? What are you appealing it for? Then we also have practical typography, which is a free online resource that gives you more in-depth explanation on the way typography works. Font is very important when you're trying to do design. So I recommend you check it out. And then there's also something I didn't cover, the laws of user experience. So user experience and user interface tend to go hand in hand because you need good user experience for a good user interface. I recommend you check that out if you're trying to look on how to create a good user experience for your applications that you guys are developing. And next slide. Now we have a Q&A session. I believe this is the end. I hope you guys enjoy and thank you very much for listening. Do you have any questions? I'll do my best to answer them. Feel free to ask about how to utilize design in other areas, such as uh, in your applications, I believe, or other things such as websites and stuff. Oh, that's a good question. So if you aren't good at art, what can you do to get better at design? There's a connotation that everyone has when it comes with design. And I always like to answer this question because Contrary to what you guys may believe in, I'm actually not an artist. I can't draw for my life. I am training, but I, when I started designing, I could barely draw anything, just stick figures. And you don't really need to be good at art to be good at design. Because design isn't really drawing in a sense. It's the idea of putting concepts together into something that looks nice. Obviously, if you have an art background, it helps a little bit. But if you're not good at art, I recommend that you take a look at what people have been deciding, understand the structure of the design, pay attention to what color combinations they use, and learn what how they utilize typography. Especially if you like, basically consume the media that you're looking at, the best way to put it. Start consuming lots of media. And when you consume that, you'll start to realize what kind of trends and patterns are universal in making something look good. And you can form your own perception of what makes a good design. You don't need, there's a TLDR, you don't need to learn art to get good design. So this is a, actually a pretty good question, Kimberly, you asked, because when it comes to resumes, it really depends on what you're trying to apply to. I'm always a fan of tailoring your resume to your job application. So if you're applying something to be a UI UX developer or something like graphic designer, you probably want to spice it up a little bit. In terms of just focusing on front end, the way I design my resume is I keep it simple. I don't go over the top. You've probably seen some resumes out there that are very custom, like they draw this elaborate like paper on the screen and then they customize the layout so that it works, that kind of thing. That works if you're trying to apply for a graphic design position but if you're trying to do for something for developer the most i'd say is just make it colorful keep it simple so keep it professional for sure don't go all over creative 
descriptive, but you don't have to keep it black and white either. There are some pretty good templates out there that are just brown in color and it looks nice and keeps the information. Remember that the resume is a showcase of your skills, but it's also a showcase of what you can do as a developer if you're doing it for front end, not your design skills. To add to that, Sean. Yes, <laughs> don't make sure that whatever design you do, you can see it. I've seen a resume that someone used the 10.5. I think it was 10 or 8 points font, and it was really hard to see. Don't do that. Also keep your resume one page. You don't want the user to be unable to you don't want the user to go over and read and read and read because they're not going to do that. No. In terms of resources or bullet shop for inclusive design, I recommend you follow the WCAG guidelines if you're doing it for development. But, and even then, it's something just to keep in mind. So WCAG is right here, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And basically what it does is it helps you try to make your design most accessible. Here. So in terms of color blindness, you want to try to avoid certain color combinations. So for example, red and green together might be quite difficult to use. In a sense, it doesn't actually, it's a complementary color, but you don't want to put red and green on top of each other. You want to make sure that there's enough, diff there's a contrast between your design. So something like white and black, that is something you can see very easily. You don't want to put your design, something like white and light gray, That that's, hard to see, even just for the regular person. All right, so the next one, what would be a good design-oriented project for someone to pursue? Okay. So when you say design-oriented project, do you refer to something like just fully focused on graphic design, or you want to move some of your software engineering skills into it? That's something to think about. Which one are you looking for? Or are you just saying it in general? And then let me, while you think of that, I'll answer your second question. So what's it like to have a design background with CS degree? Well, it's a, I actually like to say that my design background helps me a lot in development. Because when I'm developing something like a website, when I'm developing something like a website, I can use the concepts I've learned, like color, text and structure to just quickly format a layout that looks really nice and then utilize that layout for my demos and stuff and I don't have to spend time um, so I don't have to spend time on those things. Another thing that helps me with design is that it makes me think of the audience. So a lot of times when I'm designing the button I think okay what features are important on that button that the user might want? Or when I'm doing this drop down, I'm like, okay, it has this functionality, but if I do this, wouldn't it simplify the process for the user more? These thoughts come into me more easily because I have a design background and they come in my head. It's something I think of on a constant basis. I also think, okay, it might be easier to code this text right here, but the user probably won't be able to see it. So I should probably move it somewhere else, these kind of things. I feel like most importantly, the design background helps me just make something that the user will have a more enjoyable time using. And also, it doesn't, they can't deny that it doesn't help make it look prettier, too. So let's go to the design resources. So I did post a slide with some good design resources that I like utilizing. If Brittany, would you mind going back to the slide? I think it's tip number three. No, four, four, it's tip four, sorry. Those are a few design resources that you guys can utilize for your design, especially if you're doing something for the project during Shell Hacks. Just when you are looking for resources, as I mentioned earlier, I can't stress this enough, please pay attention to the attribution rules. You don't want to use something that they will, that the only you don't want to do something commercially for something that can only be used personally it can get you in some trouble and you don't want to be dealing with that legal trouble too all right so is jp morgan hired designers or is it only front-end engineers so jp morgan hires software engineers and they don't have to be front-end only they can work on the back-end side or all sorts of projects 
in terms of graphic designer UI UX, I do know there are some in our company that focus on that. A member of my team helps mentor me for UI UX. But Brittany, do you have more details on that side? Yeah, so primarily it is, it's exactly what you said. Um, we ha hire software engineers and then from there, for example, our mobile platform, you may have someone that um, specializes in that UX experience. Um, so you would come in as our software engineer and then help from a front end aspect or that UX UI. It's, there's no specific role that is um, solely de designated as a UI UX experience. Okay, sounds good. And another thing I wanted to mention is that for me, I started off as a software engineer, but the project that I'm working on does give me a lot of front end experience and that you're able to specify what you're interested in. So if that's something that interested you in the software engineering program, I think you could like check a box for that when they start pairing you up with teams. All right, is there any more questions? By the way, if you do have a question later on, you, know, you just want to have the question on the opportunities that we offer at JP Morgan, as well as just design in general, feel free to drop it off in our JP Morgan chat that we have on the Discord or just ask in the design channel as well. We'll be here throughout the whole weekend, so feel free to bother us. Another good question. So what are some ways you can practice your design skills and how do you stay inspired? One of the key things that if you are really interested in design, the best way to practice it is through repetition and practice. Keep it, make it a habit. So if you really want to get into design, create one design a day, whether that be something simple like a social media flyer or just a text logo, literally a black and white text logo. As long as you keep on practicing and making it into a habit, you'll naturally get better at it. Now, if you want to get inspired, what I recommend is look at what other people are doing, look at what popular YouTubers are saying, go through TikTok, Instagram, see what's being out there. And you might be able to find something that suits you more, suits your needs more. Not all designs are perfect. You can also go look for some groups that have people who are learning or challenges that are going on. So for example, I do know Adobe has a lot of weekly challenges and I believe Behance slash Dribble have them too. So you could take a look at that and participate. I also do know that Reddit tends to have a few challenges here and there that you can also do. Just the idea of keep on practicing and you'll eventually get good at it. It is a skill that you have to train. And even then, I say it's a very versatile skill because you can use it in quite literally everything, whether it be a Word document, PowerPoint, an email. Yes, you can design it in an email. Or even just your website or flyers and stuff. Like Design is not just for posts that you do to advertise. It's not just limited to marketing. I've used it to design a documentation once just to make it easier to read because they had it in a list format where all they had was small text and a bunch of pictures and it was super difficult to find where do you even begin so i just made a table of contents added some headers bullet points put the pictures in a neat organized fashion got six minutes any other questions This is awesome, Shauna. Thank you so much. Hopefully um, everyone uh, that participated in this workshop can use um, the tips that you provided and, you know, spice up their show hacks. Indeed. Huh? Oh, sorry. Was that a question? No, no, no. No worries. So I think we have five minutes left. We'll stick around. Um, if there's any other questions you all have, feel free uh, to put in the chat. Or if you wanted to, you know, come on screen, we'll allow you to be a moderator as well to ask your questions. But otherwise, um, again, thank you, Shauna, for this awesome presentation. I myself learned a lot. <laughs> and I'll definitely be using that come Monday when we uh, return back to work. Thank you for the opportunity.
And as I mentioned, feel free to ask on the, the Discord or whatever. Well. 